been a while. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to the UFS webinar. This webinar is hosted by the NWS OSTI. <clears throat> the goal of this webinar series is to enhance communication and share advancements in all aspects of the UFS in both research and operational settings. My name is Stacy, and I work with Yan Zhu, who is a program manager at OSTI to coordinate and deliver the webinar. Feel free to contact us if you have any comments or suggestions. I'm oh, sorry. Um, here are a few, a couple of housekeeping items that I would like to bring to your attention. Today, there will be two presentations in the webinar. The first presentation will be the GPU acceleration of FV3 and the UFS history, progress and prospects presented by Lucas Harris, who is the deputy lead of the, web, um, of the weather and climate dynamics division and the head of the FV3 team at NOAA's geophysical fluid dynamics laboratory. The second presentation is going to be FV3 applications on GPU presented by Mark Govett, who is the team lead of the Advanced Technologies Division in NOAA's Global Systems Laboratory. Dorothy Cope, the director of OSTI Modeling Division, will be introducing the speakers. <clears throat> Before we get started, um, I wanted to say quickly show you how to sign up for the webinar notifications and how to view the information on the uh, UFS website. So this is the UFS webpage, ufscommunity.org. If you scroll down to the events, you'll see the events here. Um, and um, these will be the events that will be presented during um, every two weeks. We also have an archive of the events. And you can find them there once you scroll down more and click on the archive. So today I will go back and Dorothy, you can go ahead and um, introduce. All right, great. Thank you, Stacy. So welcome everybody. And, and I'm excited to uh, introduce these two speakers. We have a double header today and, and both speakers are going to be talking about their experiences working with something called graphical processing units or GPUs. So GPUs are among the advanced computer architecture, um, the architectures that are being used by a couple of pioneering climate and modeling groups worldwide. So the ones I know of are, are Medio Swiss and, and Department of Energy. Um, those teams have been have been making use of GPUs, but they're very challenging. So it's great that we have a couple of of scientists in our in our, uh, our NOAA uh, circles that have some experience uh, with GPUs. So um, I, Lucas Harris, Dr. Harris, is, his research has been focused on the development of algorithms and software within the GFDL, finite volume, cubed sphere, dynamical core, otherwise known as the FV3, and its application in, in many different uh, worldwide community of users of the FV3-based models with his focus uh, mainly on the UFS. Um, he has a PhD in atmospheric sciences and a, and a master's in applied math, uh, both from University of Washington. And so after Lucas, we'll hear from Mark Ovet, and his interests are in the intersection of science and technology to improve prediction, including improving model efficiencies using emerging systems, developing new algorithms, such as using uh, artificial intelligence and GPUs. Mark received his bachelor's degree in computer science and applied math at the University of Colorado in Denver and his master's degree in computer science from the University of Colorado at Boulder. So uh, looking forward to both of your presentations. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Dorothy. Okay. Thank so. you. So I'm going to um, let Lucas, you could start um, to show your screen. Okay, so I'll see here. 
Um, let's see here. Ah, okay. So let's see here. Is there a good way for me to get control for that? Um, Just click on the um, show screen. Show you screen. have. Uh, so before is just given to me. Um, let's see here. I did. Uh, let's see here. Um, yeah, is it, you need to make me. Oh, okay, here we are. Okay. Um, show this window. Okay. Okay. Can everybody see that? Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you so much, Stacy. Okay. Uh, so thank you so much. And uh, before I go on, I want to acknowledge the real uh, GPU and HPC experts who uh, helped me an awful lot putting this together. Uh, in particular, uh, GFDL's Rusty Benson and Ali Fuhrer there at uh, Vulcan, soon to be uh, wound up into the uh, Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence, or AI Squared. Uh, Lucas, um, so a little bit of motivation about why we're interested in. Uh, yes? Uh, we are looking at the blank uh, screen. There is no, uh, this is blank. Do you have your blank uh, slides on? Mm -hmm. uh, so my slides are right here. Can you still see that? It just came back on. Oh, okay. Okay. Wow. Is it set up for multiple screens or? Um, here, let me try. How does that show? What does that show? Blank now. So blank I guess again. Present mode. If you go into present mode, I guess that's why it's when it's turning blank. But we can see those slides. Okay. All right. So here, let me. Uh, okay, that's a little unfortunate, but. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's worked earlier. I don't know what's different now. Yeah. Okay. All right. Here, let me try one more time. Do you see anything? Blank. Blank. Just blank. Yes. Still blank. Okay. All right. That's a little unfortunate. All right. So I'll uh, I'll be able to advance it this way. I won't do the animations anymore. But okay. All right. So uh, make that as large as I can. Okay. All right. So uh, anyway. So uh, I apologize for that uh, interruption, everybody. But uh, thank you so much, Stacy, for helping me out with that. So anyway. Um, so yeah, so I, I mentioned uh, Rusty and Ollie who helped a lot with putting this together. Um, so the motivation for uh, GPU acceleration is mostly center, has, uh, is centering around uh, global cloud resolving models. And indeed, FE3-based GCRMs have been the pioneers of, G of global cloud resolving models here in the United States. Uh, NASA Goddard and GFDL have been working on these since the mid 2000s. Uh, and then GeoSend, uh, uh, NASA's GeoSend, GFDL's UFS X Shield, we've led the uh, US contributions to the international diamond intercomparison, both the previous phase one and the ongoing phase two. Uh, these are 40-day long, almost climate-type simulations run with specified SSTs, kind of like the uh, AMIP protocol, at uh, global cloud-resolving models, which we call three-kilometer, uh, which is what we call our three-kilometer simulations. Uh, there's been some preliminary evaluations of this. Uh, in particular, GEOS and XShield have done really well in these tropical cyclone simulations. And we've been go looking to go beyond this. Uh, in XShield, we're doing a global cloud result, global we're doing a year-round simulation that's in progress. Uh, the GEOS uh, team at NASA, they've also submitted a 1.5 kilometer uh, run as well. Uh, these are very useful prototypes for future weather and climate modeling systems. Hopefully we will get to global cloud resolving resolution sooner than later. But also very powerful demonstrations of what you can do with these models as well as with uh, what you can do, as, lo as well as they're a good way of testing just how good your model is to be able to expose weaknesses and be able to fix them across all different applications. Uh, we've been working on improving the performance on large uh, HPC systems for a long time. Uh, this originally, uh, back in 2013, when uh, CPUs were a lot slower, we uh, were able to scale to over a million threads on uh, Argon's Blue Gene Q system. Uh, and then over the years, we've gone towards increasingly quick systems on Gaia and Orion with uh, a couple of tens of thousands of cores. We can get uh, 22 or 26 minutes per day, depending on the number of cores. I think we can get actually better performance than this as well with a full physics X shield model. And th these numbers are important because they're getting close to the number of cores that you might need to achieve uh, op the operational requirement. Uh, and these are also uh, throughputs that begin to make these useful models for research, although they still do require a lot of computing power. Um, so 
a little bit about convective resolving models. And here's a uh, ancient meme that shows just how, uh, how old I am, unfortunately. Uh, but we hear the term convection or cloud resolving models. This is a bit of a misnomer. Uh, one of the things that especially uh, George Bryan at NCAR has done a really good job of showing is that convective plumes are not really resolved until you get down to uh, grid spacings about 250 meters. And other researchers have found this as well. So at these three or four kilometer resolutions, you're just kind of sort of resolving uh, deep con continental convection, uh, barely representing tropical convection. You can't tell me you're simulating uh, shallow cumulus at these resolutions or definitely not turbulent eddies. And going to increasingly high resolutions, you always get to better, uh, better representation of orography. So as Richard Feynman liked to say, there's a lot of room at the bottom. We can still do better and three kilometers is not the place to stop. But higher resolutions need better physics, it's something that hasn't been really worked on a lot. And of course, we'll need a lot more computing too. Um, so uh, there have been some sub three kilometer efforts, uh, mostly outside of the United States. Uh, UKMO, they've got a really nice uh, continental United States wide model. It's run at 2.2 kilometer, 1.1 kilometer resolution. They have an operational 100 meter LES nest over London. Uh, the European Center has made a, a 1.4 kilometer global nature run. This is a hydrostatic model, I should point out. Uh, Meteo Swiss is Cosmo that we've already heard about, and I'll mention again later. They're running 1.1 kilometers over Central Europe with all of its mountains. Uh, the NICAN group in Japan, these are the people who invented global cloud resolving modeling. They're running an 800 meter uh, GCRM in experimental mode. And there are some US efforts as well. There's a 1.5 kilometer operational uh, HWARF and NAM nests. Uh, NSSL and CAPS, they're uh, doing a lot of experiments with both uh, WARF and the UFS at one kilometer resolutions. Uh, NCAR has done a lot of different things uh, as well at these resolutions, including this really cool thing they've got for uh, LES prediction around airports. So there's a lot of possibilities if we push towards higher resolutions. Um, one question that hasn't really been adequately answered though, especially when you push into longer time uh, ranges for these simulations over larger areas, how does explicitly resolve deep convection affect synoptic and planetary circulations? And we're used to, we have a good understanding of how con parameterized convection acts, but how does deep convection act, especially given, especially given that you can't really tune explicitly resolved convection the way you can for parameterized convection? Uh, and now there have been efforts to port FE3 to uh, GPUs in the past, and that they have been successful. Um, there is some uh, aspects of FE3 that is very useful for uh, applying to GPUs. In particular, it's a modular design that allows you to take these atomic stencils and apply them to 3D data. And in fact, that's how GPUs work, is that they apply simple operations to vast amounts of data. Uh, but there may be some reorganization of the code that is needed. There are two earlier efforts, uh, one about a decade ago by the NASA folks uh, to port to CUDA Fortran. They got a couple of times speed up on a socket to socket comparison, uh, 36 CPUs to six GPUs. Uh, more recently at uh, Institute for Atmospheric Physics, they ported SHIELD to CUDA C. That gets a 6x speed up, again, socket to socket, one uh, GPU card to one CPU node. Uh, and this has been successful, but there's a, it's a difficult thing to maintain because GPU, this is a constantly shifting landscape. There's new GPU standards coming out all the time, new programming standards coming out. And also, uh, we haven't focused this a lot in NOAA and NASA because we haven't really had a large scale GPU system to really work with other than the fine grain cluster on uh, Thea. Um, and another thing about GPUs is that most current climate or weather problems uh, really aren't big enough to really take advantage of CPU, of what GPUs can give you. You can think of a GPU as like a very big and very hungry dog you just have to keep feeding data to. So you need a really big compute problem to really satisfy this. Um, oh, and one health warning before I go on is that sometimes you hear comparisons between CPUs and GPUs that are one CPU to one GPU comparison, and I will actually show a couple of these later for reasons I'll explain. Uh, these may cause dizziness and embarrassment if they're misapplied, unfortunately. And I will show examples of uh, where a good GPU result, seemingly a good GPU result can lead you astray. Uh, so methods that we use to porting uh, GPUs, this is one using the ACC uh, directives. And I want to acknowledge the NVIDIA hackathon, this uh, one sponsored by Princeton University, at, by, by NVIDIA at Princeton University in 2019, and another uh, last year, a NOAA wide hackathon. Uh, we were uh, mentored significantly by our uh, partners at NVIDIA and at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Uh, but during these two hackathons, uh, GFDL employees, Princeton employees, and Vulcan employees were working to uh, accelerate some of the kernels within uh, FE3. Um, and in particular, we were applying these to the advection and vertical remapping kernels. And you mentioned, remember earlier, I mentioned these atomic kernels and the advection and 
vertical remapping are very frequently used in FE3 for many purposes. So these are the things that we want to start with. We want to accelerate uh, an FE3-based model. Um, so a little bit about ACC. So OpenACC, it's kind of like uh, OpenMP, which is something you might have heard of. But for those who are uh, unfamiliar, so uh, OpenMP is basically a way of giving hints to a compiler. And in OpenMP, you give hints to a compiler for standard multi-threaded CPUs to tell it how to parallelize a block of code and how to share memory between the different blocks. ACC extends this. It's actually quite a bit more uh, complicated than OpenMP. Um, in that you add these directives, these hints to the compiler that tell it how to parallelize a block and how to move data between the CPU and GPU. And that part is important because transferring data between CPUs and GPUs is slow and is a major bottleneck in CPU and G, uh, CPU GPU accelerated systems. Um, so you want to do it as little as possible. Um, so ACC, it's actually very simple. It's very nice. It's more portable than, Q, than uh, the CUDA method that I mentioned earlier. It's not a standard. It may merge with OpenMP. It has some problems with some complex loops. Uh, in those cases, it may be more profitable to rewrite things in CUDA. Uh, and sometimes it does require still require code. Um, so here, here's an example. You simply add this hint to this uh, code here, and uh, off you go. And uh, so here's some GPU results from the hackathon. Um, as Calvin reminds you, uh, be careful about learning the wrong thing from this or you might crash. Um, you, uh, first of all, of course, you need a big enough problem to feed that, keep feeding that dog. In this case, it's 96 by 96 by 91, as in uh, our X Shields single uh, core decomposition. Uh, and I should point out that the machine that we're working on, there's no attempt to optimize the code for the CPUs, uh, so it's uh, unfair from the get off. And there's no uh, actual message passing parallelism that way. So we're not actually scaling beyond one CPU and one GPU. Um, now, with that said, we did get a 50x speed up with all the caveats, of course. This does not mean you have a 50x faster model uh, when going from one CPU to one GPU. Again, when we compare, did a more fair comparison to say one GPU to several CPUs, and probably closer to about 10x. We have something similar for a vertical remapping for a more complicated routine like CSW, our shallow water routine. Uh, it's probably going to require more careful thought to uh, be able to get a better, better speed ups and so on. Um, but we do, but uh, at least this shows a bit, shows that we can do this and it does show a way forward in this, uh, and be able to port FE3 to GPUs using ACC. Um, we did learn a few nice things. One is that uh, FB3, which has a lot of branches for upwinding and monotonicity, uh, they don't degrade the performance as feared. In fact, modern GPUs are good at handling that sort of branching. Uh, unfortunately, things like uh, in-loop conditions that you do require, that do require copying, especially our cube sphere edge handling. Uh, once again, copying from the CPU is slow and that gives you a big performance hit. And we may need to think carefully about reorganizing the code to be able to reduce copying and uh, increase parallelism. Um, so I know Mark will have uh, quite a bit more to say about that in his uh, section of the talk. Okay, so uh, Stacy, everything going fine so far? Okay, okay, so far. Great. Okay, yeah. thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So uh, method two is to use a, a domain-specific language, and uh, in particular, we're using the GT4Py domain-specific language. And I want to stress upon here that all the work I'm showing in this set of slides is all from the Vulkan Allen Institute Climate Modeling DSL team. So this has been a fantastic uh, group to really work with. They've done some really amazing work. Uh, and I should know because there's a number of people from UW who are involved. So of course they've got to be good. <laughs> um, okay, so what's a domain specific language? This is yet more tech speak. Um, I know that there's tech executives on Capitol Hill today. Um, and a DSL is an example of using domain specific knowledge and by scientific domain, we mean a specific application, in this case, fluid dynamics and what, solvers and weather and climate models to create domain specific optimizations. And yes, thank you, Wada Correct. I did indeed spell, misspell optimizations there. I have to apologize for that. Um, and the idea is that the domain scientist, which is somebody like me who doesn't know his cash hit from his cash miss, uh, we specify the algorithm layout and some of the more fundamental operations in the solver. Um, and then you feed that DSL code into a special DSL compiler that has several different backends for a bunch of different architectures, CPUs, GPUs, uh, uh, FPGAs, quantum computings, uh, a guy in your backyard banging two rocks together, whatever. Uh, and then it chooses the memory layout and parallelism compute order for you to create the code, which then is compiled by a standard, uh, standard optimizing compiler. 
And the goal here is twofold. One is to be able to improve productivity by a domain scientist like me who, yeah, once again, I don't, without needing to know all the uh, ins and outs of code optimization. And uh, there are actually, there are scientists who are very good at this, uh, about that sub, such sort of uh, code optimization. Uh, SJ Lin was legendary in his ability of that and has a big reason why FP3 is so successful for so long and is still very successful. Um, and then you achieve performance portability between systems without needing to rewrite the code. All you need is a new backend so that uh, when Intel issues a new uh, GPU standard of the week, uh, all you need is a new backend for Intel's new system. You do the same thing for the AMD and a NVIDIA and whatever systems. Uh, the particular DSL we're using is the GT4Pi system built on the grid tools uh, framework that was originally used to port uh, uh, Cosmo at Meteo Swiss. And uh, this is a large, there's already a large community of this involved. It's being considered by uh, the German groups and at the European Center for their uh, models. Um, the way that it works is domain scientists write stencils operations in Python, which is then compiled by all the different backends. And the backend is a thing that specifies the parallelism, the looping, the data structures, and all that. Uh, using Python gives you all the power of all the Python tools that exist. Uh, I want to briefly note this really awesome Python wrapper that uh, the Vulcan folks wrote. There's a paper that's submitted to Geoscientific Model Development on this topic. You can see it online already. Uh, here's what it looks like. Uh, original, you can see the original uh, Fortran code from uh, FE3 on the left. This is uh, trad traditional uh, Fortran code. You define your uh, memory structures. Your data, your data, you uh, do explicit looping and you compute your algorithm, in this case, a uh, standard second order Laplacian smoother. On the right, is it being ported into the uh, domain specific language? And so you see the two stencils here, uh, the Dell X and Dell Y routines. You then call a routine that then uh, formulates those stencils into a particular way of formulating the algorithm. And then you can call that algorithm the same way you would in standard Fortran code. And it's this th code that's then fed to the DSL compiler and then lays it out specifically for each uh, backend. You can see here that uh, you give it hints, you give hints to the compiler to tell you what sort of parallelism you should have and how you should lay out the data. Uh, Stacy, how much more time do I have? About five minutes? Uh, about two or three. <laughs> Okay, all right, so let me, uh, let me hurry it up. Okay, so I'm gonna mention this is a big multi-agency international public-private academic partnership. Uh, Vulcan has committed a, a large team, eight people to this. They've held DSL training at GFDL that we got the whole community involved with. Uh, Goddard is also putting people on this. They've got two scientists working on this and we're continuing to work with CSCS and Medio Swiss on this. Uh, and unfortunately, yeah, I don't have quite enough time for this, but FV3 has been ported to GT4Pi. Uh, they're working on optimizing it, want to eliminate as much Python as possible, and adding. Uh, they're working with the CSCS folks to add new uh, capabilities. Um, the physics is already being ported to GT4Pi. There's already been a good, a nice success. Uh, physics is a bit simpler than uh, porting a dynamical solver, but we do already see a three to four x speed up over the original Fortran code in uh, grid tools for the GFDL microphysics. And this is a this is an, a good comparison. This is actually a node of uh, processor of CPUs versus a GPU card here. This is a fair comparison in this case. Uh, and to sor serve up, so uh, CPU, uh, traditional MPI, OpenMP paradigm, there these methods really give us a lot. Are, they're still gonna be what are used for most weather and climate program uh, uh, applications for the foreseeable next few years at least. Uh, but there's new things coming out. GPUs can give us a lot of performance for lower cost and less energy and big, big problems like global cloud resolving models and as we push towards higher resolutions. We've shown evidence that we can succeed on GPUs, but yeah, performance portability is a challenge. Uh, and I think that the challenge is really being appreciated. Uh, the hackathon show that we can make progress. The GT4Pi community porting the UFS, especially Vulcan, has made amazing progress. There's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Uh, but I'm really hopeful that these two opportunities can really uh, give us a really powerful new tool to be able to go towards increasingly high resolutions. Uh, so uh, that's my talk. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, I'll stop there. Okay. Thank you so much, Lucas. Um, we'll have a short question and answer session at the end. So if you all please type your questions in the chat box, we'll get to them at the end of the presentations. Thank you. Okay, so now Mark, it yeah. will be turn to present and um, if you can share your screen.
Well, yes. I'm having trouble finding. Um, I used to, I had a button that allowed me to share the screen, but I don't see it anymore. I think Lucas was complaining about a similar problem. So do you, can you just share uh, my screen for me? Ah, here we go. Let me try. Can you see that? Yes, we can see that. All right, I'm going to try and put it into presenter mode and see if you can still see it. Okay. Ah, it works for you. All right, I'm a little ahead then. <laughs> well, uh, thanks everyone. Um, this is great. I think having uh, Lucas here. Um, with the sign. Uh, excuse me. I, I think, uh, uh, Stacy. I think it's better. Uh, we are seeing two uh, window. One is a bigger, one is small. Maybe you also yeah, have the, to. That is his screen that he's showing. Yeah, that's the presenter view right there. I, it, it is a little challenging for me because it didn't even show that for me. It just showed that blank screen. Uh, for whatever reason, Mark's computer is set up correctly. Yeah, I, I'm seeing there's two uh, slides. Uh, uh, once the uh, title slides, there's the next slide for the background with a smaller image. Uh, Mark, may, oh, maybe... Like a, do, I see. Okay, well, how about if I just do that? Yeah, this is better. Is that all right? Yeah, it's weird. Yeah, presenter view sometimes shows that extra screen so you can see what's coming. Okay, um, well, so this is great having Lucas uh, speak um, with his science background and having the science team engaged. Um, is an important element of uh, successfully adopting um, a code um, and getting the scientists to buy into what those changes might be. Uh, so uh, GSL has been at um, this kind of work, um, exploring GPUs since 2008. Um, and I'll get to a little bit of that background material coming. This is the team of uh, people that worked uh, on uh, the GPU work, um, both with the FE3 and uh, a model that we, we developed um, at Ezreal called the NIM. So as background um, for our development activities, as I said, we began doing work in 2008. Uh, this was right after the CUDA language itself was released by NVIDIA that exposed uh, an opportunity to use GPUs, uh, to program GPUs for um, real HPC as opposed to graphical shaders and for graphics operations. So um, 2010 to 2012, um, I developed a GPU compiler called F2C. This is before there was a standard, um, OpenACC standard or OpenMP for that matter now. Um, so, and it helped um, the vendors improve the capability of the OpenACC compilers. There were three at the time. Um, and uh, that was a lot of work with uh, Cray and NVIDIA and PGI to improve the capabilities, pointing out where there were performance problems and uh, giving them examples with code that we were developing. Um, and that was really pairing uh, the scientists' involvement in developing a experimental die core called the NIM, the non-hydrostatic icosahedral model. Um, and uh, for us to uh, not only improve the scientific capabilities, but do the the work to improve portability and address performance and scalability. Um, we uh, demonstrated performance, portability, and scalability with this code uh, very successfully um, with a single source code using OpenACC, OpenMP, and SMS directives, which was an in-house MPI type compiler uh, that would allow us to run on the CPU, on the Intel Mic, which was a processor that was developed um, probably about 2012 or 13, I wanna say is the first generation. Um, and then did various generations of the GPU. We could run in serial or in parallel, and we have performance results that show uh, running on up to 10,000 CPUs or GPUs. Uh, we use the um, DOE machine for our large runs for GPUs. Um, and this work uh, wrapped up in 2017. There was a paper written here uh, describing the work uh, we had in developing performance portable code uh, with the NIM model. Um, and then with the uh, decision by the Weather Service to focus efforts on the UFS, uh, the NIM development stopped. It served its purpose in demonstrating, uh, and we learned a lot um, being able to 
uh, build a code that could achieve performance portability. Now, let's see, okay. So uh, Luke has touched on this a little bit, and I want to touch on it a little more about understanding performance. And this shows up in the paper that I referenced in the previous slide as well, because um, when we have vendors that want to sell their product, we want to make sure that people understand just what benefit really is and what it means. So we struggled some, especially in the early days, we kind of had to adapt from this rather naive way of doing performance comparisons. Uh, a lot of uh, groups reporting a single core of a CPU versus a whole GPU. And the general reports in the literature were 30 to 100x speed ups um, or higher. Um, and so there's a few groups out there that are still reporting in this way. Um, but as a rule, the uh, weather uh, community is reporting it in either socket to socket comparisons, as Lucas showed, or with a single CPU, which would be two sockets, versus a GPU. And I show that graphically. What I mean, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the term socket, it's really a packaging uh, notion for how you might put uh, processors onto a node. Uh, combine it with memory, um, have um, an interconnect of some sort, and perhaps attach some GPUs to it. This is a very simple depiction of what that might look like for a standard Intel-based 40-core dual socket CPU node. Um, so you can see the comparisons are that packaging um, is that you don't get a single core. You can't buy a single core. You can buy a, a node, and that's perhaps the best measure because it represents a unit of uh, a processor hardware uh, that you can use. Um, and it's become, as I said, the dual socket CPU has been a de facto standard for CPU GPU comparisons. Uh, misleading uh, comparisons, there's lots of them in the literature. As I said, a single CPU core versus a GPU, a different generation CPU to uh, you know older versus newer generation GPU. Um, there's examples of that, as well as a single CPU node uh, versus multiple GPUs. And all of these are misleading. Uh, it's important, I think, in whichever way you choose to be always saying uh, how you came up with those numbers. Um, if, if sticking to the standard of a, a dual socket CPU is perhaps the best way. Um, in looking at the paper um, as well, we dug into um, really addressing the challenge in uh, this growing diversity of GPU uh, type systems. Uh, the nodes themselves have become far more complex than simply attaching a couple GPUs as you see in this simple uh, picture. So I'll get to that in a minute. Um, ultimately, it becomes a question of cost and energy is how much are you spending for a given amount of compute? And if we could do that in a way that would make these uh, comparisons uh, that would be best, but it's difficult to do because we don't, uh, you know, typically we can go with list price, but we know that HPC systems are not um, procured with list prices. To give you an example of a more complex node, uh, here on the right, I'm showing you a, a node uh, for the DOE Summit machine. It's IBM Power 9, dual socket in a sense. Uh, each of the Power 9 uh, processors is attached via a high-speed interconnect. Uh, there's a network connect. In fact, there's multiple ones on this system. And there's six attached GPUs. So it's got a tremendous amount of horsepower, but it really pushes the idea of what a node actually is. On the right, on the left, you see um, an extreme example of that, which is NVIDIA put together a node, again, uh, with high-speed interconnect with 16 GPUs attached to it and a small number of CPUs. So uh, being doing cost comparisons in this way really um, has to look more at the systems and uh, making comparisons in terms of performance and scalability. A few words about portability. Uh, as Lucas said, I can touch on this as well as the um, uh, the first thing is um, approach to preserve the original Fortran. So everybody understands it. We're minimally invasive by adding a few directives into the code. Um, as Lucas said, OpenACC and OpenMP are the options today. It's least invasive for modeling teams. Um, there have been a number of efforts, including the one at NASA, to have a separate version for GPUs. 
uh, PGI Fortran was what was available in those days back in 2012. And PGI Fortran still uh, is being used by some groups, but it's not performance portable. It really has additional um, parts that make it unique. You have to use Fortran, the PGI compiler, um, and you have a separate version that wouldn't run on a CPU. And CUDA, which is more the specific language for NVIDIA GPUs, or OpenCL, which is the language used by other GPUs that I won't get to here. Um, and then uh, grid tools, I've uh, been uh, aware of and worked with Oliver Furr um, at the time he was at CSCS, he's now at Vulkan. Um, they developed um, a, a library called Stella in the early days. That was the predecessor to the grid tools work. Um, Cyclone is another uh, way in which a group has developed a tool uh, to convert uh, code that a scientist would see um, and convert it into something that the processor could uh, run efficiently. And it gives you portability. Um, it also um, gives you what they term, uh, UK Met and others now, separation of concerns. So you have the computer scientists dealing with aspects of performance and portability and you have the scientists sticking to the science. Um, it's a, it's a good, um, good way to go, and a lot of groups have bought into that. Uh, in whatever you decide to do, you have to get buy-in from the modeling team uh, to support what might be a very different looking uh, code, and for good reason that people would do this, but modeling has to be on board. If they're not, then uh, the effort will go nowhere, as the uh, CSCS group found with the Stella tool that they had developed was that the modelers simply didn't want to accept it. Uh, in terms of the, the NIM model that we developed, um, performance for a single node are shown here. This is a, a history of some of the work we did from 2010 and 11 all the way up to 2016. The comparisons were made against same generation CPU, GPU, and mic processors. You can see the mic processors were only available in two variants in 2013 and 2016. Uh, you see runtime is the vertical column, so lower is better. Um, in this case, we were seeing about between two and three times performance improvement. This is dual socket CPU versus a single GPU. And uh, in order to get around the copies that Lucas was talking about, uh, we had the entire uh, code running on the GPU, so we didn't have to do copies. Uh, the only time we had to do um, copies were for output and to do inter-process communications. In terms of the UFS, and I, I put this word UFS liberally because it was really the FV3 dynamical core, uh, we thought that we would apply the same techniques that we had done with the NIM uh, to the FV3 uh, in 2016. The first thing we did was we, GPUs need more parallelism, so we pushed the vertical loop from the original code down into the routines. Here is an example with C shallow water. And with a kernel that we extracted from the code, we uh, showed enormous increases in performance because uh, basically the uh, code ran terribly uh, on the GPU. It was starved for having enough ca calculations to do in parallel. So the runtime in this example went from 100 seconds down to 0.81 seconds over 100 times speed up. Great, but it was still slower. Um, than the, the CPU code. So there was more work to do. Uh, so that work was to look at different orderings for the loops uh, so we could see what was best, whether it was an IJK ordering um, or a KIJ ordering. Uh, KIJ is what's used for the CPU. Um, it shows uh, it's beneficial to do it that way. Um, and here is an example where uh, we confirmed that the IJK variant was uh, indeed better for uh, the GPU, but slower, uh, what we saw here. Now, this is a kernel that was extracted from the, the code, um, and we were disappointed to see that we uh, were seeing uh, slower performance results with these cases. Um, 2017, uh, we ex extended this work to not only uh, address CSW, but uh, various routines um, in the code that were heavier hitters. Um, in the D shallow water um, as well as C shallow water. And we didn't get good results. Here, this is an example where uh, this is for the whole code. So we were doing the data transfers to the GPU um, and then executing these and timing only execution time on the GPU. 
What we saw was that the CPU runtime sped up uh, quite a lot because uh, we were devoting a smaller um, amount of work per CPU task. Uh, you can see here in the graphic that for the CPU, the uh, we were using four MPI ranks for a CPU, and that was much more efficient than using a single MPI rank for a CPU. Um, and that explains somewhat the performance challenges that we had in being able to get this code to run well on GPUs. Uh, we, of course, talked with uh, SJ Lin and tried to understand um, what kinds of changes we could make. But uh, at that time, the modeling team didn't really want to support a variant of code that would could change substantially. So we were kind of uh, stuck with uh, limited options in terms of how we might continue to make progress on this. Um, there were inefficiencies. Uh, what we noted uh, for the cases we had were the limited opportunities for parallelism on the GPU. Some of that had to do with the corners and edge calculations that Lucas talked about um, that are um, really an aspect of the cube sphere grid. Uh, we were not able to address that in any fundamental way. It would have required us to have a stronger engagement with the modeling team. So in conclusion, uh, for this work, uh, the NIM, we demonstrated that we could do performance portability with the same code. Uh, in our case, the IJK ordering was better with K on the inside. Uh, we could use the GPU cache more effectively. Uh, uniform grid that the NIM has, the icosahedral grid, exposed more parallelism for the GPU. And this approach was adopted by the MPAS. They use the same icosahedral grid, the same type of loop structure and parallelism and so on. For FE3, uh, really efficient code for the CPU. Uh, it's very effective at using cache. Um, the, the ordering with KIJ uh, is beneficial. Um, however, that was problematic for us on the GPU. Uh, performance portability, we concluded, is not really possible with OpenACC. Um, and if we were going to make any um, changes to the code, uh, we would need to get support from the modeling team. Um, and we didn't really have that. So this work ended with rather disappointing results. Final thoughts. Uh, performance portability uh, remains a big challenge. We see that new computing technologies are becoming increasingly diverse. We have to have ways to uh, adapt to them. Um, if that adaption is to achieve portability, the simple solutions are always better. Uh, it's easier if we uh, make minimal modifications if we can. Inserting directives is a, um, is a good way to keep it simple, but um, in this case, it's really not possible, so we have to look elsewhere, and the GFDL team and NASA is doing that. Um, and finally, I would say um, that running the UFS in at cloud resolving scales uh, is going to require extra scale. It's going to probably require GPUs or something similar, fine grain compute capability, in order to retrieve, uh, achieve an operational capability. Um, I'm pleased that Vulcan, NOAA, and NASA efforts are uh, really focused on this. Um, I think it's important that we have both the modeling team as well as the computational team. Uh, working with Vulcan to achieve this goal. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. That was great. We do have a couple of questions. Um, a question from Dorothy. Dorothy, would you like to ask a question? Would you like me to? Sure, I, I can ask it. I guess um, I had a, a question for Lucas, but it actually applies, I think, maybe to Mark's work as well. So, so I, I assume that the work that you, the performance that you showed was for the die core only. Um, and if, if so, I'm wondering if the performance improvements would be improved further or, or degraded if physics was included. Do you have any thoughts on that? Start with Lucas, I guess, because I, I I, well, I wasn't sure whether you were showing um, the FB3 with physics included or just the dynamical core when you were showing the performance improvements. 
So the NASA and the uh, IAP results, those are both uh, full physics models, I believe. Uh, if Bill's in line, you can correct me about the GEOS results, but yeah, they did port the whole GEOS model. Um, one thing I didn't get enough time to show from the grid tools results, gt 4 pi results, is that it is really easy to port the column physics to uh, gt 4 pi because they're, they're column codes. Um, and I think the physics would be a lot easier to accelerate than the dynamics since yeah, dynamics is quite a bit more th fully three-dimensional rather than the column physics. Yeah, that, that's what I've heard is that actually putting a lot of physics in a column is, is a really attractive way to use GPUs, but I hadn't heard a group actually focus on that yet. So yeah, how much work it would actually be to, to change the code to, to do that. Yeah, and that does open an interesting possibility that, I mean, currently on CPUs, I mean, a lot of models have really expensive uh, physics packages for specific applications that make them not very useful for more general purposes, especially for things like global simulation. Um, but the GPU world could change that balance quite a bit. You could have like these really sophisticated physics packages. Now, at the same time, as you go towards higher resolution, you need less and less of those sophisticated physics, too. And then, of course, you're moving the three-dimensional LES turbulence schemes as you move below one kilometer resolution. So that could potentially be a moot issue. Right. Lots of microphysics then. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Bin microphysics. Let's run bin microphysics. There you go. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. So I would add to that that the um, the physics typically you've got to push uh, a horizontal loop into. Um, the physics routines, that's what most groups have done with um, parallelizing physics and getting it to run efficiently on GPUs. So you're basically handle it, handing uh, multiple columns to the GPU and using that as a parallel dimension. Um, physics uh, in general has a lot of branching, uh, so you need to have that vertical, that horizontal loop to help overcome the challenge with branching. Uh, GPUs have gotten a lot better. They are supporting um, branching more effectively than they had in the past. Um, but that, that is um, something that at least we have observed that uh, we have not achieved quite as good a performance improvement on physics as we have on dynamics, simply because there isn't as much parallelism that's available. Okay, thank you, Mark. Okay, wait, I'm going to read some questions that we have. One is, what is the time taken to port the FV3 DICOR code to DSL? Like, how long has it taken so far? So, it's been, so the actual, so uh, the porting uh, started at the beginning effectively of 2020, and by the end of 2020, they had, actually, I think a little bit earlier than that, uh, they had a uh, verifying uh, FV3 port of uh, gt 4 pi Now, with that said, it's still going to take additional time to port it into, uh, to be able to get performance out of it. Um, so we're expecting by the end, uh, either by the, I want to say, uh, third or fourth quarter of, uh, of uh, this year, that, we sh that they expect to have a, uh, a, port a performing version of, uh, of, of the UFS, both FV3 and physics that could be run with a, a, su a subset of physical parameterizations. Okay. Yeah, well, let me say just a little more about this, um, you know, sort of in terms of scalability and kind of an operational capability that we might want is uh, the new generation of GPUs require more and more work um, to use them effectively. Uh, so in the past, what we'd seen has been about 10,000 columns of work per GPU. Um, it's probably more like 40,000 columns per GPU now. Um, and so the constraint is um, what time to solution looks like. You know, if you've got to run uh, an operational capability, um, well then, what are you at the sweet spot where the GPU is still efficient? Uh, certainly, smaller amounts of work is beneficial for the CPU. And we just don't know at this point what that is going to look like as uh, efforts by Vulcan and, and perhaps some of these other efforts that Lucas described are going to give us in terms of a GPU capability. It's just too early, I think. I mean, Lucas, do you want to comment on that at all? Um, about the need for how much work we're going to need? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, it's, I really don't think this is going to be very useful for the current crop of problems, like relatively, like, 
even things like the RRFS, I mean, that might, I, I don't even think that's enough work to really get you enough to really benefit from GPUs. And that's a pretty big three kilometer domain. Um, and it sounds like that, yeah, as GPUs get even faster, then it may require even more work to get more performance. And at the same time, of course, CPUs are still getting faster. These, uh, I've heard some crazy numbers coming from these AMD Epic chips. I mean, I don't know how much really to believe them, but, uh, but it, it, yeah, it does sound like that, yeah, the dog just keeps getting bigger and hungrier, to say the least. Uh, now, with that said, that's also an opportunity to be able to say, hey, you know, we need to have a big model to justify the cost. Let's go beyond three kilometers. Let's go to one kilometer, like, uh, uh, like a number of groups in Europe wanting to do. Let's do LES, global LES. That's another possibility. There's amazing possibilities for that, especially improving uh, stratocumulus and uh, boundary layer simulation. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, how do you debug in a DSL environment? Okay, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so see here, so I haven't had a chance to work directly with the DSLs quite yet, other than the training we did in uh, late 2020. Um, but however, since everything is written in Python, what you can do is that at least for subsets of the problem, what you can do is you can run in Python. That gives you a whole lot of instrumentation capabilities to really dig into what's going on. And that's maybe the biggest benefit of, of having this Python way of writing things. You can leverage all the tools that are there and start to interface more things within uh, the uh, DSL itself. So you can put in all sorts of instrumentation, inline, uh, you can put an in inline graphical visualization of something. I have to say I'm not a computer engineer. So, but I know that there's like, you can think about like inline profilers are gonna be very powerful in that case. Um, inline tools for examining what exactly is uh, being done. Uh, so, I mean, right now we're stuck using like DT, DDT remotely on Gaia, which is three or four states away. Like yeah, so, so let me just add to that. Smaller problem. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, you know, this is always a challenge. You know, you get the benefit of abstraction, but it can be harder for you to dig in. Now, there's tools like DDT uh, that can help you, uh, DDT being a debugger. Um, it's always easier if you're debugging code that you recognize. Um, if you have to look at code that is in some other language, it's going to be um, more of a challenge. But you know, you've got trade-offs in this kind of thing, and these abstractions give you the scientists a higher level view. Uh, but the trade-off is that it might be harder to trace uh, debugging. Um, I think the uh, Vulcan team is aware of this, and they are looking at mechanisms to uh, improve the uh, modeler's view of what's going on underneath. Yeah, that is a good point. I mean, all these different abstraction layers are being introduced, especially, especially for these things like CCCP and so on. I mean, they make everything a little bit, quite a bit harder to debug. And that is maybe the biggest concern I have with some of these abstraction, DS, the abstracting DSLs is that, yeah, it, it, if done poorly, it could be just another black box. And already we've got a couple of layers of black boxes going on within our, uh, within our, within our, within our models. So. That is that is the hazard. I know that the the Vulcan folks are indeed quite concerned about this, and hopefully that's something that that the fact that it's written in Python could help address. Um, I know that experienced computer engineer can make really really good use of a debugger, and actually it's good for learning. People are learning those sorts of things like myself. Um, but yeah, I've, as somebody who has to run, run it on Gaia, it can be a real pain to run those things remotely instead of being able to debug a smaller problem on a laptop. Okay, and I have a response to that. It says the trouble is the trouble is that the UFS is a fully coupled model, so atmosphere, ocean, ice, etc. So converting them all to DSL is a major project. Mm -hmm. Okay. Another question um, or statement. Okay, question. To my knowledge, NIM only has one horizontal grid index. What do I, J, what, what do I and J stand for? That is a really good clarification. Uh, it is, that is correct. It is one dimension because it, use it uses indirect addressing to locate the neighboring points. So it isn't I, J, K, it's really I, K. Um, 
it's funny i haven't really thought about that for a while that model ended and i kind of forgot about that part so we um in this case we had one very long um horizontal dimension and that was beneficial for the uh, parallelism because you could break it up in any way you wanted it wasn't restricted now there are other groups that have done icosahedral models where they go with a traditional ij indexing scheme uh, but that comes with baggage which is uh, the if conditionals necessary to candle edge cases are a problem for a parallel device like a gpu so uh, in the tests that we did um, not only having a single vertical dimension with uh, some kind of lookup table to locate points uh, was good, but having KB innermost uh, allowed us to have parallelism available um, for all die core um, um, execution. Okay, thank you for that. Um, that's it for the questions. If anyone has any other questions, please type them in the question box and we can address them. Other than that, Yan, would you like to have any closing remarks? Thank you both very much for both your presentations. They were very informative, very good. Thank you, Stacy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, Stacy and the two speakers, um, we, we like to uh, uh, invite more speakers. Um, if you have any recommendations, uh, please go to the URFS portal, uh, fill out the uh, recommendation form. Um, if you have any suggestions uh, how, how we are uh, running this webinar, uh, feel free to write to me and uh, Stacy. Uh, we can try to improve. Uh, this is the first time uh, we are having uh, two speakers in, in one uh, webinar. Uh, it looks like a very uh, uh, interesting uh, dynamic discussions. Uh, we could uh, use this for more often in the future. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, Lucas and Mark, uh, you can swap the display at the up left corner next time. So Stacy, we, we can remember this to, yeah. to solve this problem. Yeah. yeah, that's all I have. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Oh, we'll see you, you next time. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Okay. Okay. Thank bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.